doesn't need introduction. He's very well known in the community. Uh, Black Badge winner, Def Combor. Yeah. I mean, this guy is like in the community. Uh, I see some uh, burp and, and some stuff going on, so this is going to be like a hands down hacking talk, so I can't wait to see it. So, uh, this gentleman is, again, is, uh, he has helped me a lot on, on this part of our group, and uh, I'm thankful because he came up today and showed up and he's going to give his talk. So, please join me in welcoming Sam Ball. All right, folks. Well, I just want to show you some stuff. I'm just going to tell you um, a lot of horror stories, really, uh, and see if I can figure out. Yeah, this might work. All right, so uh, I teach at City College San Francisco, and if you want these slides or anything, they're there at samsclass.info. But my point here is that the current state of cryptography is appallingly bad for no good reason. The math is good, but the actual practice of it is ridiculously stupid for no good reason. Ah, I see if everyone agrees. And, the, and the, uh, the reason, my personal theory is, of course, I'm in education, so that's where I see it. I think it's because we have bad math teachers in around third grade and traumatized kids, so they get this feeling that math is horrible and they'll never look at it again, and that is not justified. Math is not impossible. It's not that hard. But it is amazing how, how many people just don't look at what they're doing. So let's, um, security theater is a term, as far as I know, came from Bruce Schneier, where he pointed out there's an awful lot of cases where people do something just to look like there's security when there isn't. Like, for example, the TSA. 9-11 um, nine, nine happened. Terrorists knocked down a bunch of airplanes. Everybody got afraid, so nobody would get on the planes. So the government, in a covert bailout move, created this giant institution to pretend to make these airplanes more safe. And yet, when they test these with penetration tests, they get people to try to sneak a gun onto a plane, and their chance of success is 98%. So these guys do not actually stop any weapons from getting on the plane. They are only there to make the customers feel like someone has made the plane safer, which they haven't. In many ways, it's blindingly obvious. One thing Bruce Schneier pointed out is they spend most of their time trying to verify your identity and figure out who you are. And he said, you know, I don't care who you are. I just care if you have a bomb. Why do they care who you are? And anyway, it's, it's, this is security theater, and I don't mean to say it's completely useless. Uh, this does have certain effects that might be beneficial, and it saved the American airline industry because there's a strange thing in American culture that Americans are like small children and have no guts, and they want someone to lie to them. The British have a different theory. They say, yes, the plane might fall down. Shut up and get on the plane. They just have a different attitude. Yes, there's risk in life. Be an adult and take a risk. But Americans don't like it that way. They want to be lied to and told there is no risk. Anyway, so I started teaching hacking, what's turned out to be a long time ago. I didn't realize it's 10 years ago I taught this course for the first time. So I read this book, Hacking Exposed. And I went through here, and in this Hacking Exposed book, they had a description of this Cisco VPN encrypted password. Now, if you had a Cisco VPN concentrator, it had this config file. And look at that password. It goes three whole lines of junk across the screen. It's marked encrypted group password. So obviously, nobody could read that password. So people would just put these things on public servers all over the place so you could easily find the file when you need it because obviously there's no risk at doing that. And that is not encrypted. This is horrible. And this is my introduction to the world of cryptography theater. Um, these things are everywhere. So I went on the web and searched for them in Google and I found a bunch of them. And I found the Kaiser Permanente password file up there with the encrypted group password in it. And then I found out it's not encrypted at all. There's just a one-to-one -one translation. You don't even have to crack it. It's just... Uh, scrambled in some stupid way so you could reverse it. Here's the one I found earlier today. A bunch of them are still on the web. This, look how secure somebody thinks this is. That is like a 25 character random password. Obviously somebody thinks that is secure and it ha instead they're publishing it on the web without knowing that. So I found this for Kaiser Permanente and I went and told people, I made friend of a friend so someone would tell them and I got a response back which was um, this, that password is not a security boundary which I thought is, is a kind of epic statement. Uh, but anyway, nobody cared, but I cared. And I said, well, there's various things that bother me here. One is the inability to disclose any vulnerabilities and the fact that people just lie when you talk to them. And the other thing that's very strange is what brain 
process led anybody to do this, to make something that says it's encrypted and looks encrypted and is not encrypted? What exactly did anybody think they were accomplishing by doing this? And this is my main point here. I think there is a gigantic psychological flaw in technology where people are so terrified of mathematics that they think all they can do is make something that will look to their boss as if they have encrypted it and then hopefully run away before they notice. That seems to be the standard practice people do instead of encrypting things. I used to be in the IPv6 task force and the same thing's true of IPv6. The number one way to achieve IPv6 compatibility is to just take your product and put a label on it that says IPv6 and sell it that way. Anyway, so um, so this is cryptography theater and this is uh, what good it is. And it's amazing how much of the internet, how much of the stuff we use has fake cryptography in it. It's sort of like fake news. It's sort of mind-blowing. Uh, this technical term for this is obfuscation, where you scramble things so it's a little bit hard to read, but you haven't really hidden it in any way that prevents anybody from reading it. Things like Pig Latin and such techniques. Um, and it's everywhere, like Microsoft in the Windows registry. If you, the programs you have most recently launched are stored in the registry in case you want to launch them again, but to protect your privacy, Microsoft scrambles them. And here they are starting with Z, that is scrambled with the mighty ROT13, which is simpler than the Captain Crunch decoder ring. Um, you move every letter forward 13 in the alphabet, so P-U-E-B-Z-R is Chrome. And this is Setup64, and that's Microsoft is still using this in the latest version of their operating system, and I think it shows some gigantic psychological problem. Why would anybody ever do this? How could you possibly think you are accomplishing anything by doing this? I mean, either you don't care and you just put it in plain text, or you do care and you encrypt it. What do you possibly think you are accomplishing with this nonsense? It's mind-boggling, except humiliating yourself, exposing to the world that you're an idiot is the only thing this does. Anyway, um, and there, everything is this way. It's amazing. Android apps. If you want to just sink into a cesspool of stupidity, there's nothing to compare with Android. Um, obvious, it is blindingly obvious that people don't write their apps and they don't audit their apps. They just go for the lowest bidder, which is always outsourced to one of about three country, three developers in foreign countries that just copy their previous thing and ship it off, and it's all full of fake cryptography. More than, like, 80% of the ones. I went through hundreds of Android apps at the largest companies and most important companies I could find, and it's all crap. It's amazing. It's a great field for attackers. But so, like the TD Ameritrade app, let's take a look at this. This one is actually my fault, or you could look at it that way. Um, I went to, to TD, so here's my simulated Android, and I've got it going through Burp, and... Um, but for this, I don't even need to go through Burp. Uh, I should have TD Ameritrade and here TD Ameritrade. All right, let's go to all my apps. I have an, okay, here's the TD Ameritrade app. Now, um, what I did was I went through, uh, I went to a talk at a con like this a couple of years ago and a guy had uh, bought an Android tablet and he'd given his little girl about two or three years old games to play on the Android tablet and they were too hard. And he said, well, I wonder if I could make that game easier. How bad would it be? And he showed me how he, he demonstrated how to make a game, how to hack a game, and it's incredibly easy. Android apps come with source code in Java for all practical purposes. It's technically in Smalley, but it looks just like Java. You can just modify it and change them so you can slow things down. And I said, wow, that's really exciting. It's so much easier than having to go into like compiled binary and Ida Pro or anything. And so I said, well, how, I wonder if I could do that to bank apps, and you totally can. The Bank of America app I did first, you can totally unpack it, read it, find the password, make a Trojan version that prints out the password, and it still connects to the Bank of America servers and works just fine. And I said, this is not good. So I went and looked, and that's the M10 in the OWASP top 10 mobile, allowing you to modify an app and keep using it is a security vulnerability. And by the way, uh, some companies that care about security have prevented this, the main one being the NFL. The National Football League app, which you used to buy tickets and jerseys, was humiliated publicly for sending plain text password encryption, so they made their app secure. And it is far more secure than any of the top 10 banks, insurance brokers, or um, investment companies now. It's one of the most secure apps in Android, which is not saying much, but anyway. Um, so I tested, and almost all of them are vulnerable to this attack, where you can modify it and make a Trojan app that steals your password. And I notified all the banks, and they mostly didn't care. And none of them could talk to me. A few of them snuck up to me secretly at B-Sides in Vegas and said, you know, you should, Bank of America guy said, you should shut up, stop picking on us. I said, well, are you going to fix it? He said, no. 
I said, well, then we got a problem. But other people said they were going to fix it, like Wells Fargo and stuff. But all of them said, you can't tell anybody my name, and they can never know that we went to a horrible thing like B-Sides and polluted our corporate name by attending a bunch of evil hackers. So anyway, um, it's... So I, uh, TD Ameritrade is one of the companies I notified. And see, what I did in the first thing was I modified their app so it would put a copy of the password in the log, which is a horrible thing to do. It's the syslog. It's available to every part of the device. And I would send it to them as my proof. Look, your app has a problem. Someone can trojan it. Here it is stealing the password. So TD Ameritrade responded by changing their app to put the password in the log. So they really got it all backwards. Um, and so next time... I, they modified the app, I looked, saw the update, and when I tested it, um, it was now making two copies of the password in the log. So that caught my attention. So it's library, Android, SDK, platform tools. Okay, so here's the log. Let me make my uh, window big. Okay, so if I run this ADB log cat, come on. This is the syslog on the, oh, ADB, yeah. Android debug bridge, okay, that's the log of my Android device. That's the live log showing whatever the developers and the operating system people wanted to log. So now I launched TD Ameritrade's app, and it asked me to agree to something. Yeah, sure. Okay, now I can log in. So I'm not logged in, yes. I hit log in, there we go. I'd like to try again. Oh, I know why, pardon me, I've got to bypass my proxy. No, I don't, well, that's another problem, but we'll get there later. So, so here I am, complete idiot, and secret password, and when you log it, it'll put it right in a log. Let me see if we can spot it here. Um, if not, I'll have to use grep to find it. Looks like perhaps too many things have gone by. Let's try this, uh, pipe, idiot, grep, idiot. All right, and didn't find it. All right, maybe it updated my app. I'm not gonna struggle with my live demo. Um, I saw it trying to update my app, and I'm think I might have failed to block the update. But anyway, it put it right in the log before your name and password go in plain text right in the log because that was apparently what they got out of my vulnerability disclosure was, oh, we better do that. So. When I trojaned it again, there were two copies of username and password in the log, but then they took that out again. So um, at least they're not ignoring me, I guess. So this was pretty good too. Mayo Clinic Medical Transport. And this is still true of the very latest version from this guy named Wolf Apps that makes about eight or 10 Android apps. And they all work the same way. So I don't know why they even do this. It's more example of strange thinking, but there is this thing you can get in the app store called the Mayo Clinic Medical App, and it should be on here. Um, yeah, MCMT, Mayo Clinic Medical Transport. This, I think, is an app that people have, EMTs have in ambulances to look up information about medical things. It's got a password. And so if you look at the website where it comes from, it tells you only... Official people can use this app. It is password protected. Passwords cannot be given out except by some special process. So instead of just distributing the app by email or something only to their employees, they put it in a public store so everyone can get it. But that's okay because it's password protected. Well, you might say it's password protected, but all you have to do is suck the app off the phone with ADB uh, shell and then unpack it with APK tool, an open source product, and look at the source code, and the password is just right there called secret password. It's, <laughs> and so, you know, this is, uh, so then I tried it, it worked, and by the way, I couldn't figure out how to get the source code of the iOS app, but it's the same password. So I told the developer years ago, and he told me, quit sending me this junk, just shut up, and now it's still up there, and I'm surprised that people like the Mayo Clinic don't care. And next security conference I went to, the Mayo Clinic was sponsoring them. They were there. I thought they might punch me in the face, but I don't think they care or know. But anyway, um, so I thought that was kind of amazing. And uh, then there's this one, GenieMD, and this is also true of the very latest version. GenieMD is a medical app. You can send your symptoms up to your doctor and stuff like that, make appointments and junk like that. And it's IBM and Harvard are on this. And uh, this thing breaks SSL. So if I go to, uh, I'm running my phone through Burp. Here's all kinds of uh, connections. And um, if I go to the browser, I should be able to see a warning here. 
Uh, here's the browser. Okay, so here's my unsecured page. If I go to a secure page, like this one, okay, let's see what I get in my burp. Your burp, okay. Uh, I ought to get some kind of error message. It may not be showing it, but it's refusing to make the connection anyway because I'm man in the middle of this stuff through burp, and you're not supposed to be able to do that. Um, and in fact, let me go to a secure app. There was a bank that came and gave a talk at my class like a week ago, and so I immediately said, well, let me look at their Android app, because I asked them, what do you do if I have vulnerability reported? So oh, we take it very seriously. And I said, why, thank you. So let's see if your Android app is crap. So. I brought up their Android app, and their Android app is the best I've ever seen. It actually does certificate pinning, and it actually works. I've never seen anybody else even try it. Nobody. Banks, insurance companies, people that should care. It noticed there's something wrong with that certificate because I got burped. Behind in the middle of the traffic, and there's something ridiculously wrong with the certificate. It's signed by Portswigger, totally untrusted. This is the only app I've ever found that is smart enough to uh, correctly analyze that and give you a good error message, although a few others do block traffic. Anyway. Um, I think I saw another one somewhere that did it, but anyway. So let's go to um, those Genie MD ones. And here you are, Harvard Health. So Harvard Health is here. I can sign into Harvard Health. I can say uh, trusting user and secret password. And I can sign in, and Harvard Health tells me that uh, something's wrong, which is it's going to eventually tell me that my password is wrong, which is a very, very bad thing to tell me because it should not be able to get my password up to the server, but it does. It sends my password through burp purely through a fake HTTPS certificate without complaining at all. Now, this is not a small thing. The whole point of HTTPS is it's supposed to encrypt stuff and it's supposed to make sure that you're sending it to the right server. That was the whole point. And so I told them, and this, by the way, is so bad that the FTC actually sued a few companies for this. Um, so I CERT told them in 2014 that this was a problem, this app. They published a list of all the apps they notified. So the first one, I tried to do an Android security. First thing I did was recheck the apps that CERT had already complained about to see if they passed it. And then I tried the others, and I expected to find that everybody that had been notified had fixed it, and nobody else was vulnerable. And that's not what I found at all, because the CERT test was very cursory. And if you test manual, you find a bunch of additional vulnerable apps that CERT did not find. And almost everybody just ignored the CERT warning. And I said, man, I'm used to that. Them ignoring me, but when they're ignoring CERT, that's pretty dumb. But here's, I contacted them here. I published an article about this, medical apps that violate HIPAA by sending medical data without encryption, without proper encryption, and I got a response from them, which said a patient is not a covered entity under HIPAA. So that's good, clean fun. If we write an app that patients use to send their medical data to their doctor, and it's unsafe, and by the way, a lot of them don't use encryption at all. That's legal, apparently. And I said, well, I still feel like you shouldn't be doing it. But anyway, apparently it's legal, and so they don't care, and Harvard doesn't care, and nobody cares. They're cheerfully putting their name on this garbage. Um, and I'm kind of surprised. You know, I would think IBM or Harvard or somebody would not want their reputation on this app, but it's been years. I told them, and CERT told them, and they don't care. So it's an interesting world. Here's the lawsuit. Fandango and Credit Karma did this. They broke HTTPS certificates so that they would take a fake one, and the FTC sued them and said, look, your terms of service says you take reasonable measures to protect the privacy and security of your customers, and this does not fit in that category, and they punished them for that in 2014. But apparently it's okay to send medical data this way. Um, anyway, so then I started looking at what else they do on phones. There's more outrageous nonsense. Um, so when you log into something on your phone, some commercial app, it remembers who you are. You don't have to keep typing in your password all the time, which is, of course, very normal. So how would it remember who you are? Let's look at somebody that did it right, which is Target. Um, after I did all the medical, the banks, insurance companies, and stockbrokers, I just went through the top retailers. And so I happened to find Target is actually pretty good. So here's Target Australia. For some reason, that's the one I found easier to work with. And so Target Australia, you put in this app, and then when you log in, um, it sends your username and password to the server, but it sends it over HTTPS, and it does verify the certificate, so that's okay. And after you log in, it sends back from the server a cookie with this long random number in it, and that's how it knows you are. Now every time you log in, it sends some cookie, which does not contain your username or your password up to the server, and 
Therefore, it knows who you are. This is the right way to do it. This is what every browser does. People figured out years ago, your browser doesn't save the password, it saves a cookie, and the cookie is just a long random number that does not contain any secrets. I did not think this was exciting new information, but apparently the Android developers are not aware of this. Um, so that is one of the few people who do it right. Staples is a fine example of how not to do it. So I got the Staples app, you download this thing, and once you get it, then take a look at the local storage and you find something called encrypted password stored in the data section of the Staples app on your Android phone, which is not good, but you wonder what is that? Are they really storing the password? No one would be that stupid. Well, that's what they do. So I found a website telling you how to do this, and it's, I thought it was okay. Here's, here's the best way to do this. How do you store a password in your app? You don't. What are you, an idiot? You store a cookie. That's the best way. Why would you need to store a copy of someone's password? Anyway, if you do, though, there's a thing you have called the Android keychain, which is the secure storage area. It's like the keychain on Apple, which if you, for some ungodly reason, your mind is so messed up that you think you have to store a secret like this, there is a place to put it. Then, if that's not good enough, you could encrypt it with a public key and store that and have the private key on your server. Then when you send the encrypted stuff up to the server, nobody can decrypt it but you, and it's okay if it's leaking around. This is also not rocket science. We've been doing this for decades. Uh, but what they all do is number four. They, well, most common choice is number four. The next most common is number five. They either store it unencrypted on the phone just right there, or they encrypt it with a private key, and then they try to hide the private key on your phone. This is like putting the key to your front door under the mat. It is a very bizarre security decision, just like uh, that Cisco technique. Why would you use reversible encryption to hide a secret and then try to hide the secret key on the same insecure device? What is wrong with your brain? I really don't know. Anyway, so, um, so that's what this app does. So here's the encrypted password, and so you can detect various flaws with their encryption. Here's something I learned from the BERT book, uh, Web Application Hacker's Handbook. If you want to find electronic codebook encryption, which is so-called textbook encryption, all you have to do is make a password that's 32 characters long with all the same characters. This is 32 A's followed by a few more characters to pass their complexity rule. And what happens is it's broken up into 16 character blocks, and the blocks are all encrypted with the key and there's no nonce. So if you look at the result, it's this is the first 16 characters, this is the next 16 characters, and that's the last few characters. And the first two blocks are identical because it does not scramble things in any good way. It uses ECB mode. So you can now if you want to find the secret password, you can read the Smalley code. Here's the Smalley code from the app. And as you can see, it's very easy to read. It has very descriptive variable names. So here's the encrypted password. Here's how it creates that encrypted password. It takes the brand of the phone, the device number, the model number, the serial number, and the name of this package, which is Staples app, and it combines them together with this extra salt thing at the start, 3x3 salt, takes all that, then takes a SHA-1, and it takes the first 128 bits of that, and that's the AES secret key. So that's how they hid the key under the mat. And yet, when the, the app contains the source code, everybody can read the source code, so how do you think you can hide anything when I can read your source code? Especially when you give it a name, like encrypted password. So it's not even that hard to find. Anyway, that's, so that's the code, and I tested it. I went back and re-encrypted my password and created that block of data. So, and then I wrote an app that would reverse this in Python, and then I told Staples, and they didn't say anything. They didn't care. And so I, as I've been doing for years, my general rule is I tell people when they ignore me for 30 days, which they always do, then they become homework. I said, well, fine, you have volunteer. I, the first time I taught Android security, I used this fake app somebody wrote that made all these mistakes. But ever since then, we just use real apps, and usually the latest version of real apps, because people are so considerate as to write crap and then not fix it when I warn them. So I say, fine, I, you're happy with it that way. Then you'll be happy for my students hacking into it for practice. Um, so... Uh, I notified them. They said it would be fixed. They ignored me. So on April 13, they became homework. And so I put videos on the internet of getting the key from the storage in the Staples app and then stealing my credit card number from my Staples account. And I put up the YouTube videos and they didn't say anything. So they gave my students homework, stealing my credit card from my Staples app. And, uh, they still didn't do anything. But then I went to the ISC Squared Conference in Washington, D.C. and tried to demonstrate this live on stage, and that bothered them enough that they actually fixed it. What they did was they put in rooted device detection. 
So it'll detect if you're running on a rooted device, which is what you're going to want to do to steal the data off the phone. So I said, now, I would have to get a real Android phone and quit using my emulator, which I haven't bothered doing yet to prove that they didn't really secure it. But they made it so my exact attack will not work following the exact steps in my homework anymore. And this is a common response, which someone had a nice diagram of here. We have patched the vulnerability you reported. And in some sense, you could say they have. And I strongly suspect they did not actually quit storing the password on the phone, but I didn't, they did make it so it was slightly inconvenient for me to test that, and I haven't bothered to go test it again yet. But anyway, some, so uh, I said a lot of people do this. Now, some of these guys, like McDonald's and Ace Hardware, just store your password in plain text, which is pretty outrageous. Um, some people just have plain text login, where they just send plain text passwords over the web and everywhere. Um, pick them right up here. And then there's a lot of people with broken SSL. This guy I thought was pretty fun. He made this thing called Price Tracker for Amazon. You can install it, and it will watch the Amazon price, which, as you've probably heard, fluctuates a lot, and find out when the price hits a low value, and then you can buy your product. And it does this by taking your Amazon username and password and using it to log into Amazon. Now, see, I was at a faculty meeting. We have a lot of these faculty meetings where they have long, boring presentations of complete garbage that I don't want to hear. And so what I do is I hack into things. I went to the back, tried testing apps, and I said, holy cow, I hacked into Amazon. This is the greatest meeting ever. They said, oh, I have no idea what they were saying up there, but this is great. And I thought I hacked into Amazon. And I said, that doesn't seem right. Amazon couldn't be this stupid. This, these guys have nothing to do with Amazon. Some third-party guy decided to make something that will watch your Amazon account, and he did it by taking your Amazon name and password and using it to log into your Amazon account. Amazon has no participation in any of this. And I sort of thought they would care, but... um. So I contacted him. I said, dude, your app breaks HTTPS. You can put it in the middle attack. And he said, yeah, I just put that in the last version. Do you like it? And I'm like, dude. He said, yeah, you know what happened? Before I put that in, people could get these error, irritating error messages on the screen. And they were complaining. And I said, I know how to get rid of those. I'll turn off the encryption. There. Now it doesn't pop those stupid error messages anymore. It's great, isn't it? And I said, but... But, but dude, you can't just turn off the certificate validation and leave it that way and not tell anybody. He said, why? It's working fine. People are happy. I said, dude, well, look, I put an advanced page. You can go in the advanced settings and turn it back on. But why would you want to do that? And I'm like, dude. Anyway, so this is a, from his point of view, this is a desirable feature. And I said, I tried to convince him. We went back and forth like six or eight times. I said, you really can't just turn off the fundamental security feature of the phone and not tell anybody and feel like that is great. And he said, well, all right, I'll fix it. But I don't think he ever fixed it. Anyway, so um, then there's people who use this reversible encryption, which, you know, Microsoft figured out around Windows 95 that they should stop storing passwords with reversible encryption. And they deprecated it and turned it off. And Android developers have not yet even noticed it's a bad idea. So anyway, Safeway, Walgreens, Kroger, Home Depot, they're all doing the same stupid thing. Here's the Home Depot password stored locally. And uh, all you have to do is unpack the APK, You'll find the code that encrypts the password, and they're all pretty much doing the same stupid thing. They're using password key derivation, uh, PD, PBKDF2, and then combining junk to make the password, like just a fixed string. This one uses the string. This is a very insecure key. Um, they do something equally stupid. And um, so you can get the key, and I wrote various Python programs to recover the password for all these apps, and then send all these guys notifications, and they don't care. But anyway, it's good practice for my students. This is all the Python it takes to make something that will take the data off the phone and retrieve the plain text password. Um, so I tried it in various cases. Anyway, Kroger's the same, and Safeway's the same, and Walgreens is the same. Everybody, so what's going on here? Uh, I noticed after doing all these apps, there's really only like three different kinds of apps. I think there are really only three people writing Android apps. And they have like five fake names, and they all pretend to go through a company in Texas that just outsources it to Pakistan or wherever they are. And they're all just reusing the same libraries over and over and over. And over there, somebody thinks it's okay to do this. And apparently, nobody in America ever audits their stuff, which is what amazed me. You know, I thought there would be managers auditing your stuff to see if you did it right. And obviously, there is not. They just look to see if it appears to work, and that's it. Um, by the way, a few people actually did fix things, like Golf Galaxy and JP Morgan. They had a password exposed in the log, and they fixed it. And they had broken SSL, and they actually fixed it. So um, what's funny is that I couldn't get through. They had all these contact forms, and I couldn't get through. So I finally found the CEO on Twitter, which I've done three or four times. The CEOs of major companies are on Twitter, and when you tweet them, they will answer you 
which surprised me. And so I said, uh, let me send you a personal private message. I said, dude, your app has a serious security problem and no one seems to care. And when I go to the form and try to turn it in, I just get errors and I can't turn in any porn. So he said, so the, the guy called me and he said, in the first place, don't do that again. In the second place, here's my phone number, call me if you find a problem. So I found another problem and called him, didn't get an answer. But anyway, um, <laughs> it's, but you know, this is, to be fair, I've been more on the business side of this, you know, when companies start, they think, look, we're going to sell products like cookies. I sell you a cookie, I take the money, that's it, we're done. And it's really painful to realize that when you sell someone an app, it's like adopting them as your child. They're going to come back, I need more money, I want to borrow the car, I need an update, I need a patch, there's a security problem. You have to keep on spending more and more money taking care of them forever, even though they don't keep paying you more and more money. This is why, you know, Microsoft finally got fed up with this and they said, we're not going to sell you Windows 95 in a box and call the transaction done. We're gonna make you pay every month for subscription to Office 365 because that much more correctly describes our relationship with you. You're gonna be back every week bleeding. Oh, there's a bug, there's a security flaw, I need a new driver. And we're just gonna to have to keep spending money on you forever, so you better be paying us money forever. That probably is much better. Anyway, um, so the companies all wanna hope that this isn't gonna happen. So then there are people that really have to store your password. The web services where you really log in. They have to know when you put in the right password and they have to store it somewhere so we can see what they're doing. And what they're doing is, of course, no better. So Team Ghost Shell is one of the hacking clubs that went and stole a whole ton of data and dumped it on pastebin so I could examine it. And they have some complete incoherent political dribble about how somehow they're saving the world by doing this, which, you know, is all garbage, but it is handy for me since I want to see how people are storing stuff on the web. So they hacked into the CIA, but it's not the CIA you think it is. It's like a uh, housing development in Florida. But um, anyway, they hacked into all these groups. And so here's the types of password storage. Well, here I thought plain text is the worst thing you can do, but I was wrong. You could do this. This company is called BB Exchange, Buchanan Bond Exchange, and the passwords are Buchanan Bond 1, Buchanan Bond 1, and Bond 1. So they're just the name of the company plus one. So that's pretty good fun. And here's another one, Reeves and Associates. Um, the passwords are mostly 1234 or 12345, or OS Law of 321. You know, they just all have some default value, the name of the company plus 321 or something, and they're all the same, and stored in plain text on the web in a database with SQL injection vulnerability. And then there's Sparkland, this company called Sparkland, and the passwords are all Sparkland. Um, yeah, the column next to the right. Admin password is the administrator, all the rest are Sparkland. So this one's called Sales Info, the highly secure one. So anyway, the, um, then B Forward had these transactions with and they had all the personally identifiable information in them because at this time, I think this has changed now, but at this time, passwords were not considered personally identifiable information. So if you leak a password, you didn't have to notify the customers. Um, but but the name and address was PII, so this company B Forward was in trouble when SQL Injection dumped out the customers' names and addresses. And here's their passwords too, which are here. At least they're not all the same, but they are um, plain text and easy to see, PEUZ82 and so on. And on my phone? Anyway, um, yeah, I forgot to make my phone private. <laughs> I'm very incompetent at operating phones. Let me see if I can make it shut up. Nope, okay. When it's ringing, there's no way to make it shut up anymore. Anyway, so then the next thing you could do is you could use Base64. Here's B Forward, a Japanese auto parts website. And the passwords are over there on the right. They're Base64 strings, M Z R J D. And down here, they in their terms of service, we employ commercially reasonable security measures to protect, prevent unauthorized access. So commercially reasonable is base 64, which of course you can just reverse trivially like those Cisco passwords. Um, but that's, that's what they do. And why anybody would bother with this? It's not as well as put them in plain text as do something that stupid. Now, MD5 and SHA-1 is also a common fictitious belief that this is protecting passwords. Um, when it is fundamentally flawed because the whole point of MD5 and SHA-1, they were designed to be fast. So that if you download a movie and it's 600 megabytes, you can check the hash and you don't have to spend an hour calculating it. And fast is what you do not want for password hashes. So here's MD MIT. MIT, one of their uh, minor servers, had these open SQL injection and uh, all these password hashes. And the, the person that downloaded them was able to crack Hiawatha 
You see it in the middle there, and the other ones they weren't able to crack, but I was able to crack them by just using a decryptor site. I didn't do anything sophisticated here. And so here's this guy's password. It's Borg7R5A. He probably thinks that's a pretty secure password, but when you store it with one round of MD5, it's not very secure at all because you can very easily try millions and millions of guesses. Anyway, they do have a nice incident response form, so you can tell MIT about this. I don't know if they care or do anything about it, but at least they have a way to report it, which is better than most people. And then MySQL, 323, has the ability to store passwords in a hashed form. And there are various forms here, and some of them are actually reasonably strong, but not these. And you can crack them with Kane. Um, and here's a SHA-1 hash that somebody used, one round of SHA-1. And that's also easy to crack. And there it is, Ben2469740. That's like a 10-character password or letters and numbers. He probably thinks it's secure. But I could just put it in an online form and crack it in a few seconds because SHA-1 is not strong enough. And here's MySQL 5 and um, WordPress passwords, which can be pretty good. But a lot of these were cracked. These, this one was Chicken2, Marine, Chicken2. And the last one, again, I was able to crack by just finding a better online site. It's Evanat, which looks like somebody's name or a word backwards or something. But, you know, even those relatively strong hashes are not strong enough. So then we get down to the CIA. Um, and so the CIA here has got uh, real customer names and addresses leaking out and phone numbers. And... Um, so anyway, if you want to store these hashes, the right way to do it is there are really a couple, a couple of algorithms out there which are good enough for simple use, although there was a password hashing contest and a bunch of European cryptographers I saw at PasswordsCon the last couple of years that talked about. There are these advanced cryptographic features you might want, but bcrypt and scrypt are good enough for most purposes. B and all bcrypt is, you cannot use MD5, SHA-1, SHA-2, or anything like that because it's fast. And that means I can take a database of 100 million passwords and try them all without waiting too long. And that's just what you don't want. What you want is for it to take something like 10 or 20 milliseconds to calculate one hash. Then when you, the person logs in, they send you a password, you hash it, it takes you 20 milliseconds, and you see if it's right. 20 milliseconds is not too long because humans are typing and they won't notice that time delay, which is fine. So it doesn't hurt you any, but it really hurts the attacker because now they can only try 10 or 50 guesses per second, so they can never get through a list of 100 million passwords and try them all. Now it's good enough to just have your dog's name followed by the year you were born because it's not going to be the top 1,000 passwords and they don't have time to try the others. So that bcrypt is just many rounds of these other hash functions, like 5,000 rounds of SHA-512 is what Unix and the Mac use. Microsoft continues to use one round of MD4 because they are very strange. And they, their password hashing system is so old, they designed this before MD5 had been written, which is why they used MD4. And they never updated it since 1993 in Windows NT version 1 for some unknown reason, while the rest of the world has gone up to 5,000 rounds of SHA-512 so Microsoft password hashes are literally one million times weaker than Linux password hashes and Mac password hashes. Anyway, then we can talk about other basic logic errors, like locking your bike in this fashion. Um, and one example here is the San Francisco parking meters. In San, Black Hat, Joe Grand went to the San Francisco parking meters. Joe Grand and other people in Noisebridge, they decided to check out these new electronic parking meters where you can put in your card and it detects it. And here's how the parking meter works. The meter has some counter, it sends it up to the card, then the meter uses that to generate a password, then it sends the password up to the card to see if it's okay, then when it's okay, it decides you have enough money. Now, some of you may have noticed a logic problem here. Who decided if the password was okay? It was the card. That's a rather strange thing to do, isn't it? So all you have to do is make a card that always tells the meter the password is okay, and now you have all the money you want. That's, it will always have full of money. You can make a card that sits at this maximum value of $1,000 and never goes down and always tells the meter, oh, yes, everything's fine. Oh, yes, I have enough money. Oh, yes. It's, you know, why would you ask the card if the password is okay? Very twisted. And anyway, so that was in 2009. And uh, then there's encrypted storage. Now, we've all heard this, right? Everybody's losing laptops. They have whole pallets of them at San Francisco Airport. They get thousands of laptops, and they just auction them off every year, all the laptops people left on airplanes. And all those are just full of company data. And this is really bad. This would be breaches. So they put um, encryption on them. 
And uh, before that, there were these little thumb drives everybody used to carry, and I saw a survey about eight years ago of top executives, and they said the average executive owns 20 USB sticks and has lost 15 of them. And I was certainly in that category too, and all those things are full of company data, of course. Why else do you have them? And this is not good, so there became an interest in making sure these things were encrypted. Um, and here's an example of 70 laptops waiting at the uh, New Jersey airport in one month at the TSA lug area and so on. So they decided to make secure flash drives, and this is from 2009. So in 2009, these secure encrypted flash drives were not really all that secure and encrypted. Um, what they did was they did not do the password verification on the thumb drive. They did a password verification on the PC. And the password on the, the drive was always the same. The, the encryption key was always the same. The, the password was just telling it to use the encryption key that was on the drive. So all you have to do is hack the app on the computer to accept any password and tell the thing, okay, they gave me the right password, go ahead and decrypt it. It's basically the same thing as that parking meter. The untrusted device is the one deciding whether it's okay to tell the trusted device that you've been authorized. So by making a modified app to put on the PC, they can open any drive. So that was the whole threat model shot. I mean, the threat model was someone who's gonna steal your laptop and have the drive, and you want to be able to tell your regulatory bodies that we didn't hold have a data breach because the bad guy will not be able to read the data on that drive. But all the bad guy needs to do is use hacked software, and it will be able to read that because your password is not used to encrypt the drive. Your password is just used in software to tell the drive that you have permission to open the drive. And that's not the same thing. Western Digital is more of the same. Same story here, Western Digital passwords in 2015. They had the same problem. Um, they all, all these drives tried to meet some official standard that was far too complicated and would have many different people with different passwords that would have access to different areas of the drive. And they found it far too difficult to actually do that. So what they did was encrypt all the data on the whole drive with the same password, store the password on the drive, and put all that in the app again. Now the app decide what part you're allowed to see, which of course is not good enough. And so they were totally able to uh, um, just make a modified app that would read all the encrypted data on the drive. And then, of course, you probably saw last week, BitLocker is also shot, and I'm amazed. I'm waiting for the lawsuits. Every company in the world has been trusting BitLocker for five years, and they've been losing 50,000 laptops a year on the airplanes and telling all everybody, we didn't lose that data because BitLocker is secure. And it turns out that BitLocker is horrible because BitLocker does not perform any encryption if it detects that you have an encrypted SSD. Then it says, oh, the SSD hardware is taking care of encryption, so I don't have to do it, and it doesn't tell you that. And it turns out that the SSD encryption is still the same way as all the other ones. The SSD encryption is worthless. It's using a key that's on the SSD to encrypt it and just making it seem like you have to have a password to get at it when you don't. So all those lost laptops can totally be opened, um, except for the ones that have magnetic hard drives or the very few where someone actually understood this and went into the registry or group policy or something and told Microsoft BitLocker to put another layer of encrypted on an, on an encryption on an encrypted device, which is what Microsoft said a couple days ago you should do. They say, now you can make BitLocker do another layer of encryption on top of whatever's there and then it would be okay. And it would be, but the problem is there's all those laptops already out there being lost in the hands of thieves that people thought were safe, so I can see huge lawsuits flying around. Anyway, so, you know, this is my big message. Learn some math. I mean, this is not that hard. If you, if you were in third grade and your teacher convinced you you were stupid and you can't understand math, try it again. It's not that hard. I had a student who would go on a warpath. Math is horrible. Anybody who does math is a terrible person. You should just get rid of them all. It makes me feel bad. And I said, you know, try it again. He went and took algebra. He said, Hey, this isn't that hard. It's not that hard. If you can count on your fingers, you can do math. It's just you were taught in a really cruel way in American education that made you feel stupid because they did it wrong. If you go back as an adult, it's not any harder than anything else you've learned to learn how to do this. Besides, you don't need to be a genius and invent a new cryptographic algorithm. For God's sake, don't do that. Just use the standard stuff that's there and learn how to use it correctly. All you need to understand is hashing, public key encryption, and private key encryption. And if you have something called private key encryption, that means you've got a key, and you have to somehow hide that key. That's a problem. So if you are handing someone a storage device that's going to get stolen, you don't have anywhere to hide the key, so you shouldn't be using private key encryption. 
That's all it is. It's not rocket science. You got to use public key encryption in that case. And so, you know, this is my, there should be management that is examining your work. And management should be asking these questions. Do you really need to store this data you're storing? Like, why are you storing the password in your app's data directory on a phone? What makes you think you have to do that? You don't do that in a browser. Why do you think you have to do that on the phone? I'm baffled as to why they do that. Then if you are storing something secret, is it encrypted? How did you encrypt it and where did you put the key? This is very simple. Like, you know, step one of most security is how, what is it you value and where is it? Most businesses have a huge problem with this. They say, well, we have this stuff we value, like customers' credit card numbers and our proprietary PDF files. And they say, where is it? They say, well, it's uh, on our server, and it's on my thumb drive, and it's in my Dropbox, and it's on my home machine, and it's on everybody's phone, and it's on everybody they sent copies to, and all our vendors. And gee, I don't know how many copies of it there are everywhere. And they say, well, that's step one. How about enumerating where your goodies are? And then we can start talking about making sure that they're protected. <laughs> And it's the same thing here. You sh management does not have to be technical. They should ask these very simple questions. Where is the goodies? What protection is there? Where did you put that key? It's amazing that they aren't. And so, you know, that's why I, I feel like uh, I wanted to tell you about this. Yeah. Um, you should, okay, in the first place, if, all right, if you're going to put the key somewhere, you have to put it somewhere safe, and this is the huge problem. Um, the only... The only case I can think of where private key encryption is actually any use is for something like encrypting your backups, where, where you have the key never leaves. It's not any good for sending messages, because if you want to send a message to someone with private key encryption, you have to somehow send them the key. And therefore, if you have some safe way to send the key, you could just send the message that way. So private key encryption is fundamentally logically useless for almost any application. It's all we had until 1979 when we invented public key encryption. Um, until then, all encryption required on this oxymoron called a shared secret, where I have to tell you a secret, and we two know it, and nobody else knows, and therefore, we're screwed because I don't really know that nobody stole it in transit, and I certainly don't know that you're not losing it or making extra copies. There's no way I can detect that, so I have a shared secret, which is a fundamental weakness. Now, a lot of people have done things that way, but public key encryption is the alternative. I can have a private key and a public key pair, and now I can receive secrets. I can tell everybody the public key. They can all send me secrets. Nobody can read them but me. That works. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you've got a point. That certainly would work. And I, for the recording, let me just say what he's saying. You could use a password and then run it through bcrypt to make a key, and then that would be as secure as the password. So you could have a secret that is stored in a hashed form on the phone that's hard to recover, and that would probably be what they should have done for those encrypted hard drives, or several different people are going to encrypt portions of the hard drive. But for things like Android apps, they should never have done any of this because there was no reason to store the password on the phone at all. But anyway, you're right. That, that can be done, and that is an alternative. That's one way to handle a secret. But most people that end up thinking along those lines have already gone down the wrong path because they could have just not stored the secret on there at all. And, but anyway, it's, that's a good point. And there, by the way, I wanted to mention there are some other advanced issues to think about here, like one that has gotten the cryptocurrency community is the world's greatest shit show. I mean, they're just a bunch of crooks. So it's, it's, it's incredibly clear. People, what they do is they have this baffling complexity. It is exactly what they did with mortgage-backed securities in 2008. They say, you're going to finance somebody's mortgage. Well, then a person would say, do they have a job? Can they pay it back? So we don't want you asking that question because the answer is something you won't like. So we'll make this mind-boggling, baffling aggregate security for you to invest in that 
mixes it all up with layers of complication to keep you from realizing I'm picking your pocket. And that's what cryptocurrency community is. Endless complexity to dazzle you while I pick your pocket with the other hand. And the, um, but the, anyway, one thing they've done lately is a bunch of them are claiming to be quantum proof. So I should mention quantum computers are coming. Quantum supremacy should happen about next year. Google thinks they have achieved quantum supremacy and they are partnering with uh, NASA to prove it. And nobody knows if that's true or not, but if it isn't true this year, it'll be true pretty soon that real working quantum computers are here. And when they are, our current forms of public key encryption will be shot. RSA is doomed. Even keys a million bits long will not be secure. So in them 10 or 15 years, we all expect the current public key systems to fade away and become useless. But replacements are already out there. There are 72 candidates still surviving in the current contest. And so there will be another generation of public key encryption, the main Winner is expected to be lattice encryption in the form of Google's new hope. But it's, anyway, it amounts to about the same. There's a private key and a public key, and it works the same. It'll just be different algorithms running on the end. Yeah? Oh, wait, so you're saying you don't believe in blockchains? Oh, blockchains, uh, this is a very good question about blockchains. Uh, cryptocurrencies and ICOs, I don't approve of at all. I think they're all just pyramid schemes and scams because um, I used to work in pyramid schemes for the Federal Trade Commission, and I I was the expert in the finances of pyramid schemes, and that's all they are. Um, but, and, and Bitcoin in particular is an attempt to disrupt the financial structure of the global economy and a totally failed one. But anyway, they, 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 those cryptocurrencies are like political stunts or something. But blockchains are important and worth learning because they will be used in every company very soon. Not public blockchains with everybody in the world mining, but private blockchains between your company and its branch offices and business partners to do things like supply chain management. In five years, just like everybody has a Mongo database and a SQL database, they'll have a blockchain database because there is some business use of it. It's not going to change the world, but it'll be another wrinkle on a database. The, block, the only point of a blockchain is Everybody can write to it, and nobody can erase anything. So you have an unalterable log of what everybody said, and there are certain uses for that. Um, but making it public and making the whole world able to mine it is kind of nuts, and that's what the public cryptocurrencies are doing, and they're, they're a solution in church of a problem. Unless you really believe that we need to alter the way money works on Earth, in which case they're far too slow. That's why Ethereum, I heard someone describe Ethereum last week as the world's giant, biggest supercomputer, but it's not. It's an infracomputer. It's how do you make computing a million times slower? A strange thing that most people wouldn't really want. But every time I do an operation on my machine, a million other machines have to do it too for no apparent reason, but that's Ethereum. Yeah. So blockchain for supply chain for... Yeah. Yeah. Well, blockchain is secure in the sense that it is a record that is cryptographically signed that cannot be altered. And if you want it to do it, the thing I tell people, go to IBM's Hyperledger. Hyperledger is the business blockchain. It's ready to go. It is already being deployed. I've, I've taught crypto classes with blockchain all summer and last year, and a lot of my students are deploying it. It is not a public chain with everybody doing things like Bitcoin. You run it on your server just like the other databases, just like your Mongo and your SQL and everything. And your, the point of it is if you are a business and you have to deal with other people you don't really trust, which really is pretty much everybody, but Lockheed Martin I know is doing it. You're trying to build an airplane. You need to have staff from here and electrical components from there and aluminum from there, and you have deals. And all these people promise things, and then they don't really deliver on time, and then they try to lie and say, I sent it and something. So you just want a record. Of, Here's what you promised promised, here's when you shipped it, here's when we got it, here's when we filed our complaint, you therefore have to pay this fine or something, and that's what a blockchain is. Everybody can share this database, they can all write to it, nobody can ever alter anything in the past, so we have a clear record of what happened that nobody can argue about. That's what it's for. But not you don't share it with the whole world, you share it with your business partners that you're trying to establish a trust relationship with. And of course, the idea is if everybody knows you have a good blockchain running, then they will know not to bother trying to lie to you about living up to their promises anymore because there's a record and we can all check and make sure no, like, you know, Trump keeps saying tomorrow that he didn't say what he said yesterday. And nobody cares in the world of politics, but if you had a blockchain in a business, people would say, no, we have the record that you said something else yesterday. It would matter. In politics, for some reason, it doesn't matter, but that's, that's another psychological issue. Like everyone's fear of math, they have some strange emotional attachment to someone who appears strong, whether they make sense or not. 
Christian. Anyway. What's that? Oh, I teach a bunch of stuff, but I do teach a cryptography class. So let me bring up my classes here. Um, if you, I did it for this reason. I started doing all these uh, uh, security tests of various things, and I realized that people don't know the very fundamentals of cryptography at all, which I thought was pretty obvious. So I teach the usual stuff like hacking and malware analysis and exploit development and incident response, but I also teach a cryptography class. Um, this is what's going on this semester, and this is our CCDC course. And then at the bottom, I got what's coming on next semester, which is here. And I'll be doing the cryptography then, and the hacking Android phones, and securing web applications, which is the Web Applications Hacker's Handbook. And other teachers are now doing the forensics I used to teach, and other good guys taking that over. So, you know, we're, our department is growing, and we got more people. But the cryptography class is just plain mathematics class, but it's not got any of the math that people are afraid of. We don't have to do any proofs or anything. It's engineering. It's learning how to use cryptography. I don't expect anybody to invent a new cryptographic system. Please don't even try. There's no need. <laughs> Whatever you think you thought of, that you think you're smart enough, you're wrong. That's all you're going to learn is you're not as smart as you think you are. The 10 smartest people on earth have written cryptographic systems, and the rest of us just need to bow meekly at their feet and use them. <laughs> uh, if you think you invented something good, you're wrong. Just use normal stuff like RSA and AES and SHA-1 and SHA-2. Those things are there for a reason. Brilliant minds have put immense work into making those things better than anything you'd think of in the shower. And so, but you do need to learn how to use them correctly. And that's what this is, the engineering. You're learning where's the key, what keys are produced, what should you do with the key, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, well, I did publish that in magazines and stuff. Microsoft uh, defended themselves. The Microsoft developers that did this defended themselves when I published this in 2600, like six years ago. And they said, well, you know, we added a second layer of encryption on top of it to protect the password hashes. That's what, this is like, you know, you have a bucket with a hole in it. So what you do is you put it in a bigger bucket that also has a hole in it. Um, so they had, they used a crappy hash routine. So to recover it, they put reversible encryption on top of it and hid the key on the operating system. So quickly people found the key and they can get in. So, but that was their defense. It's, and it really shows, uh, to be fair, it was a long time ago when people were more naive, but it's, what most people do with encryption is they're like little kids just taking blocks and hammering with them without even knowing what they are. They say, oh, encryption, okay, bang, bang, bang. I put in the encryption. Oh, put in more encryption, bang, bang, bang. There, the boss will like me more now. They don't even understand what they're doing. So they take something broken, and then they put another layer of something broken on top, and they say, there, it's all fine now. And their boss apparently doesn't know enough to test that either, which is what surprises me. Because, you know, managers have responsibility. I remember when, um, was it Target that got hacked because they had the vulnerability in their Apache struts? I don't know if it was Target or one of the other, which one? Equifax. And the manager was interviewed, and they said, oh, why, that idiot didn't put on the update. Shame on him. And I'm like, dude, you can't be saying that. If your staff doesn't do their job right, you can't say, it was my staff, it wasn't me, you're the boss. The question is, why did you hire that idiot? Why didn't you train that idiot? Why didn't you give them a civil war? You're the boss. So you can outsource work, but you cannot outsource responsibility. If you lose the data, the manager is responsible. Look, you didn't run your company right, and your staff lost the data. You're guilty. And you can't say, my staff is incompetent, because the question is, well, why did you hire incompetent staff and not review their work then? So managers should be checking to get answers to these basic questions. What did you do with the key? You know, And they're not. It just, because they're all afraid of math so much, is my theory, that they'll say, oh, 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 I'll just believe anything you say. Please just make the math go away. And, and the, yeah. Oh, KeePass and LastPass, as far as I know, they're okay. I know some of them got hacked and had vulnerabilities. I use a password manager. I got one of them up here. I think it's LastPass or something. Uh, yeah, it's LastPass. And they got hacked and they fixed it. You know, I think it's far, a very good idea to use one of those things. It's far better than reusing passwords, which is the reasonable alternative. So you should have a different password on every site because I look at what they're doing at the other end. Holy crap. They're, they're storing it in a plain text database with SQL injection at the other end. So you have to have a different password everywhere because <laughs> the people at the other end are just throwing it on the ground like trash. And, um, and I highly recommend a password manager. You should get one and get used to it you'll be a lot better off then than, than trying to remember all your passwords. 
Um, of course, a uh, low-tech solution, which is perfectly fine, is write them all on a piece of paper and store that piece of paper where you keep your $100 bills. Normal people know how to keep a piece of paper safe, and, and that's all right. That's really, that amounts to the same thing. Then you've got a different password at every site, and you've stored it somewhere safe that no one's going to steal on your computer. That's not bad. Um, that's okay, but this is the electronic version is, is nicer for the electronic people that are more happy using a computer to store facts. But, but whatever you do, don't reuse passwords. That's really asking for it. Any others? Okay, well, I guess that's it. I'm going to turn on the lights. Close your eyes. Thank you. Thank you.